CGTN, China Global Television Network. Many urban centers around Africa are already struggling with growing populations, which put a strain on living space, infrastructure, and services. Now, Africa's urban population is projected to increase by an additional 950 million people by 2050, which will further compound the problem. A 2022 conference in Kenya's lakeside town of Kisumu centered around the role of intermediary cities of Africa in the implementation of the UN Agenda 2030. This recognizes the urgent need to develop a resilient and sustainable urbanization in Africa. But what exactly is meant by sustainable cities? What are some of the innovations and changes that are being put in place? And what more can be done across Africa? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, South Africa has one of the most developed economies in Africa, but like many African countries, its population growth rate is a challenge for the infrastructure in urban areas. But one city that is putting in place initiatives to cope with some of these problems is Cape Town. My colleague Travis Andrews brings us more. As one of the greenest cities in Africa, Cape Town is forging ahead with an ambitious plan to become a sustainable city in the future. The groundwork for that is being laid through the pursuit of various sustainability initiatives, including renewable energy projects. The city has set an ambitious goal to become carbon neutral, and steps have been taken to achieve this. One of the major goals that the city of Cape Town has undertaken is to reach carbon neutrality by 2050. And this is obviously a very ambitious goal. And uh, there are a number of sub goals in that, such as focusing on the built environment uh, and looking at new buildings being net zero carbon by 2030 and also leading in our own example uh, in our own municipal buildings and leading through example uh, with really efficient buildings and um, installing our own renewable energy projects. To fulfill the city's energy needs in a sustainable way, it will be developing a number of renewable energy projects, including its two megawatt waste to energy project. That will reduce the waste ending up at landfill sites in a sustainable way. Electric buses are also being piloted in Cape Town, with plans to expand that project. We have to have a complete overhaul of our energy system and transport systems to start looking at um, transport and energy that comes from renewable and zero emission uh, sources. So for, for us, that means moving away from petrol and diesel vehicles and moving towards more electric vehicles, more zero uh, emission fuel vehicles. A clean green home has become the city's blueprint for what could be possible for Capetonians who embrace carbon neutrality in the future without breaking the bank. For some Capetonians, the city's move to a sustainable future should be in line with its continued commitment to good service delivery. Uh, Cape Town is a city that works well enough. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, you have potholes and stuff, but generally the roads are pretty decent. Um, the buses, yeah, I know they run, you know, they're pretty reliable. Um, the refuse services, everything, you can kind of count on them more or less. So that's pretty good. With less than 30 years to go, every step taken to make Cape Town more sustainable is seen as a step in the right direction. And also a great example for other cities in Africa wanting to follow a similar path. Travis Andrews, CGTN, Cape Town. Well, joining me now to unpack the question of sustainable cities are from Mecca in Saudi Arabia, Umar Sela, Acting Director General Office for Africa UN Habitat. And joining us from Nairobi, Professor Alfred Omenya, CEO of EcoBuild Africa and a specialist in green architecture and sustainable urbanization. Thank you both for uh, being a part of this conversation and joining us on the program. I mean, let me start off with you, Professor Omenya, because, you know, this concept of sustainable cities has been with us for uh, quite a, a while. It's, it's, it's a concept that is understood or not understood by many. What is your understanding of a sustainable city? No, thank you very much, Beatrice. Uh, you, you're right. Uh, the concept of uh, sustainability has been around. And I think part of the reason is that uh, why it's not been properly uh, implemented is, is because uh, I think different people 
have different ways of interpreting it. But, but at the center of it, the first issue uh, that we're looking at is uh, the, the issue of uh, environmental, is uh, environmental matters within the city. Uh, you can call them the green issues. You can co also call it physical aspects of sustainability. So whether we're looking at green infrastructure, whether we're looking at urban open spaces, whether we're looking at reduction of climate change, whether, whether we're looking at uh, disaster risk management within cities, all that fits under the first pillar of sustainability. The second pillar, which is uh, just as important, is the social cultural aspects of sustainability. Cities are for people, and we're saying that um, uh, cities should be done in a way that uh, people living in the city can optimize their lives, not just uh, um, in terms of use of the physical infrastructure and services of the city, right. uh, but also from, uh, uh, from a social perspective. Uh, in terms of their practices, be, be it their religions and so on, uh, in terms of social infrastructure, you're looking at education, health, um, and, and, and other things, in terms of recreation, um, and so on. So All the right. third one is economic. Uh, and, and, and by economic sustainability, we mean we should actually grow our economies in a way that protects the environment and protects culture, and at the same time, that benefits the people within the city. But, and last but not least, we need to look at institutions. So the, the institutions are eventually the ones that uh, you know, drive all, all, all the other three that I've, I've highlighted. Whether you're looking at laws, whether you're looking at legislation, whether you're looking at practices, whether you're looking at systems of governance, the cities must put in place to deliver on, on, on good environment, to deliver on social cultural issues, and also to deliver on, on economics. Omar, you know, you and Habitat has been spearheading this, con uh, you know, this concept. Is it taking root, particularly when it comes to African cities? Let's look at uh, the definition of sustainability, you know, uh, bringing back this, uh, you know, 20 years back uh, scholar discussion around sustainability, which is mainly, you know, looking to long-term vision of our development and catering, you know, future generation to come. And if you bring it in the paradigm of cities, and I fully agree with my colleague Alfred, there's a number of parameters we need to look at. Right. Uh, first of all, from our end as UN Habitat, is the physical dimension, which is the physical planning. Uh, today we have seen rapid growth of uh, African cities uh, in a way that uh, sometimes it's difficult uh, you know, to control this growth in a particular way that you can have a best allocation of people under the space. you know. And this uh, is leading to what we call urban sprawl today. And we have seen a lot of informalities mm -hmm. in cities in Africa. So today's the ratio on informality in cities in Africa is 64% of urban population living in informal settlement. Which you mean that if we will talk about sustainability, it's about getting right our planning of our cities uh, to make sure every function of the city is well located, but also every human being has space, uh, you know, where to stay. And this lead me as well to the particular point raised by my colleague Alfred on the social function of the cities. City is not just for 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 for, for trading. It's not just for uh, for for business. It's about for about people. Cities about people. We need to put, to put people in the center of right. our work. That's why I think access to basic first service is very key. And without access to those function of services, it's very difficult to talk about sustainability today. As I mentioned it. Uh, with the COVID-19, we have seen, you know, an increase in inequality in cities in terms of access to water, sanitation, electricity, uh, transport, and all you can name them. So, which means that today we are far, you know, with this COVID-19 of reaching this element of sustainability. Right. Let me jump uh, in there. Uh, Omar, I, and I want to go back to Professor Omenya here because we're talking about all these lofty ideas of what a sustainable city should look at. Let, let's look at the practicalities of it. For instance, when it comes to African cities, are Africa cities sustainable? Can we say they are sustainable cities? No, because African cities are not sustainable. Uh, but I think more worrying is that uh, African cities are running away from, uh, from potential of sustainability. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the economics, Right. We are getting more and more inequality in African cities. We have got a few people, uh, you know, earning a lot of money uh, from, from global businesses uh, located uh, in African um, uh, cities and towns, while the ordinary person within the city does not benefit from the economy. Many a time we hear uh, countries uh, talking about economic growth of, uh, you know, 7%, 10%, and so on. But if, if you ask the ordinary person, 
uh, living in these cities, uh, living in the streets and so on, their, their situation is getting worse because um, these economies are really not beneficial to individuals. Uh, a, a good example is Johannesburg uh, in South Africa, where that's one of the richest cities in the continent. But if you look at the distribution of that wealth, the ordinary Johannesburg resident is poorer than it was uh, in, in apartheid time. And then, of course, if you look at governance, again, you find that people have no say uh, in their city. Uh, and, and as such, they can't influence any de decision making. So the cities are autocratic. You are given services that you may not even need, uh, want in the first instance, while the most critical things that the citizens need are not addressed. Let's look at those critical issues. I want to hear those critical right. issues that, 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 you know, that uh, the citizens are concerned that is not being addressed because we do know that urbanization has brought many challenges in Africa. What would you say, Professor Omenya, are the most serious that need to be solved now? Business, we just need to go back uh, to, uh, to the, the, the growth of cities and urbanization in Africa and all over the world. And uh, the reason why people ended up moving from rural areas to urban areas, why would anybody in his right, uh, right mind leave the village uh, and come to the city? The, the first thing is that people are looking for economic opportunities. When they arrive in the city, they find that the, the sort of economies that the cities are running are so different from the skill sets that they actually have. And there's no attempt at all uh, to either uh, have uh, the sort of economic ac activities that are aligned with the skills that people have or to upgrade the skills that, that the individuals have. Number two, and Omar has alluded to that, right. uh, one expects a better life in terms of uh, um, infrastructure and services. One expects a better home in the city. Uh, we, 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 we have, and Omar has uh, again put that figure on the table, we have got 62% of Africa living in informal areas. Uh, in, in Kenya, in, in fact, it's about 64. In Nairobi, is uh, actually at 72%. So, so basically, you are saying these people are living in substandard housing. These people cannot access uh, basic infrastructure services. They cannot uh, uh, access uh, good quality sanitation. Right. They cannot access water. And water is very expensive for them, even when they do. And, it, and, and it's actually of poor quality. They cannot access electricity. Uh, they're, they're concentrated in small spaces where they're endangered, for example, uh, when, when pandemics like COVID broke the other day. So yeah, there are so, many, so many troubles. There are many issues, uh, many challenges that uh, seem to be afflicting Africa cities. Uh, Omar, let me hear from you because this is a concept that has been, you know, that, that has been spearheaded by UN Habitat. What does it take to, ter to transit into a sustainable city? Uh, Beatrice, I would like to, to be uh, a bit uh, positive uh, on the analysis of the trend of urbanization in Africa. Of course, there's a lot of things we need to look at it. But if you look at what happened to other countries, cities are producing more than 80% of the GDP in many you know, countries in the world. Why not Africa? And we have a potential in Africa because today we've got more than 60 million, uh, you know, 600 million people living in cities. And by 2040, we'll see you know, more than half of the population are living in cities in Africa, which is huge potential in terms of development. And the whole question is how to harness this value of this rapid trend of urbanism in Africa. Uh, one element is the vision. What vision do we have for our cities? Many cities are growing without any indication of what direction they want to take. Mm -hmm. But the reason why UN Habitat is promoting what we call the national urban policy, which is a framework they can be participate, bring all actors around the table to really define a direction for their cities. I'm happy that Kenya is going to this direction. Rwanda is going to this direction because Rwanda will tell you in 2030 what they, how they want to see right. the city to be transformed. I uh, know the element, as I mentioned, it, the governance element is fundamental because at the end of it, it's about behavior. It's about social behavior at the issue. We can't have the best policy, the best you know, uh, legal, legal framework in the world. If people are not abide to that, you know, it will be difficult to really you know, bring order in our cities. A lot of uh, you know, things we are seeing in our cities are related to lack of this enforcement of policy and laws. You know? And that's the reason why UN Habitat put an emphasis on the governance element, right institution, a strong institution, strong as well participation mechanism for citizens to be aware of what is their role on shaping you know, together the cities. Omar, we're going to take a short break and come back later. Uh, for now, we'll take a short break. When we come back, we'll have more on building sustainable cities. Don't go away.
Welcome back uh, to Talk Africa. Well, still with me on the program discussing uh, sustainability and sustainable cities are Omar Sila and Professor Alfred Omenya. Now, before we took the break, we looked at some of the challenges faced by Africa's growing urban populations. Let's now delve deeper into more solutions to the problem. Uh, Professor Omenya, let's talk innovation because based on your thoughts and discussions earlier, you know, what is the most innovative approach to dealing with challenges associated with Africa's urban centers. Can you give some specifics of innova innovations that have worked in African cities? Uh, thank you, uh, Beatrice. I'll, I'll, I'll give a very specific uh, uh, um, example of uh, what Kenya uh, is doing now with this part of the British government um, to, 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 to illustrate uh, how some of the challenges that we're talking about here from planning to economics and so on uh, can be dealt with uh, uh, within the city. And um, I'm, I'm talking specifically about the Sustainable Urban Economic Development Program for Kenya, which is really uh, at the heart of this particular conversation. And that program, the way it has been uh, designed is that um, these particular towns uh, that are involved in the program come up with uh, a, a special plan, and, uh, and then they come up with an economic plan that is actually uh, directly linked with the special plan to say, what are the different economic activities that will happen within this particular space of the city? And then they proceed to actually uh, bring in investors who then, uh, who then set up uh, very, very specific uh, uh, industries uh, that can support the economic life of the city. And I'll give examples. In the coast, you're looking at fish, fish processing in places like, uh, like Malindi. Right. You're looking at uh, tourism and tourist markets in places like Lamu. You're looking at uh, abattoirs and livestock markets in places like Isiolo, you are looking at uh, agri-processing uh, of coffee and tea. So, so basically what this program tries to do right. is to speak to the pillars, where we're saying, let's look at the physical by planning, let's look at the economics by again creating an economic plan, and then of course governance must be, is, is critical there, and then we're saying, let's operationalize these plans by realistically looking at how investments are brought to the cities and how those investments can actually impact the highest number. All right. Uh, Omar, you know, uh, how, how do we create better inclusive cities here? Because let's talk innovation. And you've been very positive so far as to where Africa cities are going. Are you seeing examples of African governments, though, to putting the national context in place? How do we create better inclusive cities and achieve sustainability both in the short term and the long term? I think there's a huge momentum to say is in the current context of COVID to use these cities as a, mo of a engine for economic transformation. We shouldn't forget this political element of things as well. So how we can leverage, you know, this political engagement from, uh, you know, different level, uh, multinational level or subnational level to get together to really frame this uh, vision we want to talk about. Uh, the second point, as you mentioned, it, when it comes to innovation, is about integration of different aspects. Mm -hmm. Today, we have seen a lot of uh, countries uh, articulating, you know, the national urban policy with the national development plan. One element, one country is Kenya, of course. Another country is uh, Rwanda, Ethiopia today, and also Senegal, where you have seen a lot of innovation coming now with the new cities of Jamnyajo, which is a way of, uh, you know, uh, decentralizing a bit, you know, infrastructure from uh, the big capital of Dakar uh, toward, right. you know, the center of the country where you can attract investors, as mentioned by Prof, uh, which is very important. Inclusivity in a fact that we need a way of uh, wealth distribution. Of course, today there's a lot of work that needs to be done because we are talking about 18 million jobs needed every year in Africa to create in the city. That's why we need to be very innovative or look into different form of partnership, public-private partnership and people partnership. And one area where you have, where Africa is quite behind in the area of housing. And we have seen some very, uh, you know, innovative approach in Rwanda, for example, on delivering affordable housing system. And my last point and the inclusivity as well is looking to the aspect of disaster. And I think Professor has mentioned it today with the risk of climate change. We see what happened in in in, in Mozambique areas right. now is a cycle which has become something normal now. So it's how to can support cities to come up with resilient plan and the rebuilding plan uh, to face those aspects of adaptation and mitigation of the issue of climate change. Thank you. So Professor Amenya, we are looking long term, and and uh, you know we are looking at what cities will look like 
in 50 years, in 100 years, for instance. And we understand b that by 2050, for instance, 60% of African populations will all be living in cities. By 2030, the world is projected to have about 43 mega cities. And Lagos, if we take that as an example, has grown from about 763,000 in the 60s to 21 million today. How should Africa be preparing for this era of mega cities? I think one of the key things that we need to actually look at in terms of urbanization, and, 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 and uh, um, Omar alluded to that, uh, Presidi is focused on that and so on, is that, uh, yes, as you're urbanizing, we must direct uh, most of the urbanization in secondary cities and secondary towns for a whole lot of reasons, uh, you know, from, uh, from economics to availability of land to po a potential of good planning and so on. Uh, secondly, we need to actually start generating long-term plans with these numbers in mind. I think the, the problem is that uh, we tend to plan um, and, and develop infrastructure uh, without people again. Uh, because if, if, if you start looking at people, then, then the issue of the population will come in. We'll be asking ourselves, how, how will Addis, uh, Addis Ababa be, you know, when you're, when you're looking at a population of, uh, of 20 million, of, of 10 million? Kinshasa already is a mega city at, at 10 million. How will it be? when it hits uh, you know 40 million and, and and so on and so forth and for me i think i think we need we need two critical things number one we need uh, uh, the forward looking uh, planning that basically uh, would be creating new opportunities uh, for housing new opportunities for infrastructure new opportunities for industries and so on and so forth and then on the other hand we need and i've articulated that in uh, africa vision 2063 we need to prevent dystopia what do i mean here I mean that uh, the wretched of the earth who live uh, in, uh, in in formal areas, that their lot must not get worse. Because if it get, gets worse, then these cities will become more and more dysfunctional. So we must also practically get get in there and ensure that uh, you know we are reducing slums by mm -hmm. actually turning them into proper uh, areas of accommodation with infrastructure, with land tenure, with titling and so on that can be subjected to planning. Even, even though that would be difficult and must happen incrementally, that we have to do. Because if we don't do that, then we'll get into the hell that are referred to as the urban dystopia. So we need to look, to look at both. We need to have proactive planning, and at the same time, we need to get into these areas uh, that uh, are urbanized uh, badly and, and fix them, uh, even, even though the solution will not really be, uh, be ideal. So in this era, Omar, in, in this era of growing megacities and potential megacities, what would you say is one critical area that African cities must look out for? Uh, first and for me, it is about the political will be at risk. Uh, I mean, uh, we shouldn't be surprised by this rapid trend of urbanization, which relate to our demographic trend in Africa, which is one of the fastest in the world anticipation and political will to make sure this is a priority for government. How many, sometimes very difficult to convince the government to really, you know, take into consideration the rapid trend of urbanization because it addresses on a hot top matter. And that where the issue of visioning is very important, make sure early stage from now we are able to define different strategy and different uh, direction that I uh, want to take to anticipate those uh, elements. Uh, the second point, as I mentioned uh, by, by Professor as well, the planning aspect, uh, I mean, it's all about to uh, organize ourselves. On an individual basis, if you don't plan your day, if you don't plan your months or your life, you still, you know, may get uh, trapped. That same that uh, when you talk about sustainability of cities, all right. is about space, all is about linking and perpetual space. If you plan very well, you know, our city will be able to anticipate those uh, particular elements. The third point, as well, the governance element, uh, because uh, we shouldn't be as well surprised uh, sometimes to see why our level of service delivery is so down, because we don't have the level of governance and skills we need uh, to make sure, you know, we can respond to those challenges. Let's improve the governance system, make sure access citizens are heard on this uh, different strategy and option we are putting in place, make sure as well citizens are benefiting from public spaces, from those resources we are talking about, so that they can bring back you know, their skills and their contribution to the sustainability of those cities. So I'm going to get uh, a very final comment from you, and if you can just make your comments very brief um, you know, as we wind up the program, I want to get your last comments, and as you do that, uh, let's look at the state of our cities and the growing populations. If left unchecked, what would you say would be the worst case versus the best case scenario? Professor Omenya, to you and very briefly. 
Beatrice's cities over time have been destroyed totally, not just in Africa, but uh, in different parts of the world, because they were not actually taken care of. A uh, plague has uh, uh, broken into the cities. Uh, we are hearing cyclones. I'm working in Malawi, and, uh, and, and we see their disaster after another. Uh, we are looking at physical and social disasters. We are also looking at political disasters. We are looking at crime uh, in places like Johannesburg and in places like you see here in Kenya and, uh, and other places. We must actually build cities that are planned. All, all Africans have a right and should live in planned settlements, number one. Number two, all these settlements must look at uh, the eco economic potential that can actually put resources in these people. Number three, uh, we must actually have people who are dignified uh, socially and culturally who can thrive as individuals. And as Omar says it, we must actually have the political will and the governance that will then deliver uh, 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 these cities, manage these cities as they should. Otherwise, we'll slide into dystopia, we'll slide into African urban hell. But we have an opportunity, of course, of pushing this thing into African urban paradise. Thank you, Beatrice. All right, Omar, you have the final word and very brief. I mean, the best scenario for me, uh, Beatrice, is to allow the young generation, uh, you know, those uh, million of uh, young generation to find a job and livable condition in cities. Uh, and that's something we shouldn't forget because right now, from 2015, we have, uh, you know, witnessed more than, you know, increase of young population, 300% in African cities. And that's something we need to look at as well because this is a future, uh, but it was, this is a need. Uh, that we need to address uh, and linked into the extremism we are seeing in Africa. Professor has talked about uh, insecurity. We have seen a lot of conflict in Africa now happening in secondary cities, and which is bringing a lot of insecurity and because the young are destroyed. So how we can transform cities uh, in a you know, hub of peace and security, but also of, of, of hope for all those generation is very important. The worst scenario for me is not being is being able to plan and to anticipate on those issues we are talking about today. We are talking about climate change, we are talking about conflict, we are talking about insecurity in cities, and we are talking about increase of population. How policy can be put in place to drive kind of consultative process at various level and to really bring the you know the mechanism that can help you know government at the local level right. to get insight from the population. I think it's very important the people centric approach that you inhabit us promoting. But the reason why why when we talk about smart city is about putting people in the center for us what is important for people to be happy in cities and that's my last word all right gentlemen a very insightful discussion there but that's all we have time for on this edition of talk africa big thank you to our guest today umar sila acting director regional office for africa un habitat and a professor alfred omenya ceo of ecobuild africa and a specialist in green architecture and sustainable urbanization thank you both for joining us uh, on the program today remember you can be a part of this conversation online through our social media handles on facebook and twitter and you can also cut the show on our youtube playlist to keep the conversation going and join us again next week for more uh, talk africa for me beatrice marshall and the team here in nairobi until next time it's goodbye